Uh, good evening again. Uh, let me welcome you to our fourth uh, Good Meetup, uh, hosted by Good Data. Um, for those of you who have never heard about Good Data, let me give you a quick introduction. Um, I would describe Good Data as a man in a, a, man in a middle uh, between your data and your data consumption. Uh, good Data can help you uh, to consume data using um, open API, semantic layer, SDKs. Uh, the reason why we are hosting this event uh, is because we have strong front-end and UX teams, and it would be pity not to share the best practice we have with you. Uh, regarding organization, uh, we have four presentations. Each presentation will take approximately about 15 minutes. Uh, there, there will be shared slide for Q&A and we will have break in the middle. After the presentations, please stay. There is going to be food, drinks. You can network with other people. You can talk about what you are doing and what you would like to do or your experience with UX and front end. And now let me please invite Andy with his first presentation, uh, integrating AI from an front end developer point of view. Andy, the stage is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Andy. I uh, work as an engineer here at Good Data for almost three years. And uh, I want to tell you about my experience integrating uh, generative AI, basically large language model, open AI, that kind of uh, things into Good Data, the, the POC that I did for that. And uh, that is me. And uh, that's the bread and butter of mine, the technology that I am mostly working on. You can see that I'm pretty much a purebred front-end developer. I work with TypeScript, React, uh, Node.js, Angular, uh, in, in some previous experience, Python, C Sharp, and uh, <laughs> PHP. And uh, you can imagine my uh, confusion when I returned from vacation uh, on a nice uh, sunny day in September, and my manager tells me, hey, we need to, you to build a chat with AI capabilities. So I was thinking like, um, all right, so I guess I'm learning AI now. Uh, but luckily, there is OpenAI with their very nice uh, re um, REST API, so I was saved. And uh, um, basically, the technology that you can see here, even a small subset of them, is more than enough to uh, to build a chat uh, with uh, natural language capabilities. And uh, that's exactly what I did. Basically, um, I created two POCs. Uh, the, the first one was uh, this uh, smaller window. It's basically a helper for analyzing your data. You can ask it analytical questions like, what was the average order uh, order summary of uh, last month or something like that, and it will answer, and you can even create a charts with that. And the second one was uh, the dashboard creator, where you can uh, talk about dashboards with with AI, and it will help you to structure dashboard, and uh, uh, you can iterate over it, and so on. So that's uh, that's what I did, and that's what I'm uh, going to share with you, the experience, how did I build it, and what the takeaways that I have out of it. Um, so the, uh, the application itself is quite simple. It's built with uh, React Redux and uh, Redux Saga, um, very simple UI for, uh, for uh, React. You have a space where you can see the messages and the input field. The Redux is uh, used as a state machine to hold all the message history. And then there is a Redux saga to basically uh, talk to OpenAI. And the first the first message there is always uh, some, some sort of a system prompt that you can uh, tell, with, with which you can tell to OpenAI um, the context, what it needs to know about the system, about the workspace, what kind of database you have there, what kind of tables, and so on, because we're building an analytical solution here. And uh, imagine uh, this this uh, simple scenario. User asks a question 
what is the average uh, product price per uh, product category. And uh, it's just added to the Redux store. Of course, React immediately renders it in the messages. And then the whole uh, message stack is uh, sent to OpenAI together with some metadata, the functions that OpenAI can call um, uh, from our application. Basically, how it works is that OpenAI doesn't have access to our database, right? It cannot just go and calculate the product price or um, slice it by product category. And it doesn't have the access. But it can ask us. We can tell it, OK, you have this number of functions uh, for aggregation, for chart creation, and so on. And you can use that to, um, to, to request this data from us. And uh, that's exactly what OpenAI does in this case. It asks us to aggregate data, data for it. It provides some arguments to the function, like what exactly, uh, which which facts exactly it needs. Uh, it is added as another message, and uh, uh, Redux Saga again comes in and uh, um, makes the request to Good Data Server uh, for the data. Uh, Good Data Server responds with the data we add it to the uh, to the stack of messages, and uh, again send the whole the whole conversation back to OpenAI. Now, OpenAI API is completely uh, stateless, which means that every time you make a request, you need to send the whole history of messages. And it's basically reading through uh, through the messages and uh, one by one, and then generates response out of this. So it again reads that user asks for that. It reads, OK, so I already asked for this data. And hey, this is the data that was returned to, to, to me. And this time it re responds, since it's already have all the data needed, responds with the text message that is um, replied to the user that user sees in the UI. And uh, you can see that um, technically there is a lot of things happening under the hood uh, to make this happen, especially if you're just using front end for the whole, for the whole application. Uh, but if you split it into these three three sort of uh, things, the, the UI, the store, and then some sagas, it's actually quite simple. You just need uh, a very simple sagas. You need a very simple store, and you need a very simple UI. And uh, that's what we did um, in Good Data. That's how we tested some ideas of what AI could look like integrated into our, uh, our product. Of course, for productization, this is not enough. Um, for productization, you would need to move a lot of this logic to server. You would need to uh, take care of security and performance, uh, which is not not possible uh, with purely front-end application. Um, you might want to use some newer APIs. Uh, OpenAI just recently released Assistant API. It's still in beta, and it helps you to reduce the boil boilerplate it basically um, stores the state for you, the, the the list of messages for you, and so on. So it makes things much, much easier if you just want to quickly prototype stuff. And then there are some, um, some techniques that are prevalent in open source LLMs, not, not really open AI, but other, um, that help you make this whole LLM, uh, this whole chatbot experience more consistent uh, make sure that it returns good results every time. So retrieval augmented generation is basically a replacement for function calls instead of OpenAI deciding which function to call and uh, um, uh, then generating the response based on that. You first decide uh, with maybe smaller LLM or some even heuristic logic um, what user actually wants and only provide to OpenAI a subset of that. Uh, of that information, and uh, then it will just convert it to a human readable response. Uh, so there are a lot of techniques. Uh, I will not go too much into details here because it's for front-end developers, and this is more like uh, for some data scientists and backend guys. So we can skip on that. And uh, before I continue to the outcomes for, for these POCs, I want to explain a little bit what large model, uh, large language model is and how it uh, works because it's important. It has an implication on when and how you can use that. Uh, so is it magic? Um, not really. If you have the task for, for a lang large language model, something like the quick brown fox jumps over a lazy 
dog. Thank you. <laughs> and um, yeah, if you ask the open AI to finish this phrase for you, how will it approach it? Um, first, it will split the phrase into tokens, basically do the tokenization. By the way, this is the real split. Uh, I used OpenAI to do this. Um, the, in this case, it splits every word as a separate token. Sometimes it's uh, more like one word per few tokens. Um, but nevertheless, uh, then it converts it to the token IDs. Um, that's what the large language model works with. And you can see here one interesting thing. You can see that um, the and the, it's the same word for us, right? But uh, OpenAI translates it into a completely different set of um, IDs because it's uh, one one is uh, starts with the uppercase letter, another with a smaller case letter, and there is a space in front of the second one. So for for the open AI, for uh, OpenAI, it's basically two different, completely different words. And how it works is that it um, reads these tokens and um, tries to predict what is the most likely next token in this sequence. That's all it does. It doesn't know uh, anything about foxes or dogs and uh, how one jumps over another. It's just uh, based on all the information that it read. It basically read the internet. It predicts what is the next token and then next and then next and then next until it thinks that it's done. And then you basically convert it back uh, from token IDs to the actual textual tokens, and that's how you get the response. And uh, my point here with all this um, lead in is that for OpenAI, this can be a very valid, very good response because it doesn't do two plus two. It does uh, token two, token plus, token two, token equal. What is the next, mo mo next most likely token that is going to be after that? Yeah, in 99.99%, it will probably answer four because that's what internet says, most of the internet uh, messages out there, websites. But it might happen that you have your prompt, your question to open AI um, set in some very specific, pe peculiar way, and it will decide that that one website that uh, that is trolling you and telling you two plus two is more relevant for this uh, question than all the other internet, and it will just respond to you that it's five because it doesn't care, it just takes what is the most likely. And that is, it has the big uh, implications for us as a developers to integrate um, large language models into our system. We can never rely on them uh, to do some logical stuff, to do some calculations. It's a tool to understand human language. It, it's a tool to generate some nice new content and suggest it to user, not to uh, like, do the right operation and uh, update your database, but suggest the, the uh, thing to the user. And uh, then I have a few takeaways uh, from, from this POC, something that we are going to be uh, using when we are actually productizing uh, AI in good data. First, uh, user's trust is very hard to earn. Uh, you know that uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT, they have this stigma that they very often hallucinate and they tell you uh, stuff that is not real. And uh, you need to give user an option to validate the results right away. So they are very sure what is uh, the, the response that they are given uh, is the correct one. Um, in this example, how we do it in our POC is that you have this I button and when you click on it, um, it will tell you which exactly facts from the database, which database column pretty much it was using to make this calculation. So you can quickly check, okay, yeah, it makes sense. It looks correct to me. I'm aggregating this by this and uh, that's the result. That's fine. Um, another thing is uh, AI must never have write access, uh, write operation access. You always want to double check with the user before actually sending some posts or puts or delete requests to server. Um, I have here a somewhat artificial example, like I, I can write to a Flex AI and say something like, I don't like this dashboard and it will suddenly decide that I want to remove it, uh, even though it might not be my initial like idea behind it. I'm just saying that I don't like it. Uh, so I would very much prefer that it confirms it with me before doing it. And uh, if we don't, you know, this is a very easy pass to some future that we don't want to see here. Um, 
The second takeaway is uh, divide and conquer. And basically, what I'm trying to say here is one huge uh, Flex AI chatbot that has everything in it is a nice thing, but it's a gimmick. It's like uh, Apple Vision Pro, you know? You put it on, you play with it a little bit, and then you get tired of, of the weight and you probably will not use it every day. It is something that you can play with, you can brag about with your friends that, hey, I have this nice tool, I built this Flex AI, or I have a Vision Pro, but really, are you going to be using it every day? Instead, what you want to do is you want to integrate this into the tool that your user is actually using every day. I have here our dashboard editor in a somewhat weird state because I opened some extra dialogues, but never mind that. And uh, you can imagine that OpenAI can easily suggest the title for the dashboard if you already created the, the, the text, the insights in here, because it can read what kind of insights are there and it can generate some title. The same way it can um, suggest some filters that make sense for, for this particular uh, dashboard or suggest a, a description of the inside and so on and so on. So instead of having one one huge chatbot that more more most people will probably never use, uh, we should focus on integrating tools into our uh, application, uh, into the workflows of the users in the way how they do it. And that's pretty much it uh, for me. If you have any questions, we have, I think, a few minutes left. Uh, so go ahead. Other, uh, if not, then uh, just ask on Slido and uh, we can talk about this later. And there is one more thing I would like to add to in this presentation. If I'm not mistaken, uh, this chatbot Flex AI is part of our labs environment, right? So you can register uh, to our labs environment and try it out yourself. The only thing you need is uh, bring your own uh, open API token. Uh, so the first question was, why do you use open AI and not uh, open source LLM? Well, we are going to introduce also option to use open source LLM alongside with open AI. And what we're planning to do is uh, to so kind of separate the uh, this, uh, to use uh, RAG and other um, non-open AI APIs to enrich the content, uh, enrich the prompt for uh, for the LLM with, uh, with our data. And this will allow us to not use open AI, but pretty much use any LLM as a drop-in replacement. Uh, it's just that for POC, it was so super easy to use OpenAI. It has a very nice REST APIs and it's just a uh, no brainer. If you need just a POC uh, to see what is possible, then OpenAI is uh, the best tool for that. Yeah, so behind that is uh, pretty much an open source Python library, so you can build it quite easily. It's not it's not all that complicated, and uh, uh, the text that you have uh, there generated is actually generated by OpenAI based on the uh, data generated by Python script. So in theory, it's pretty easy to to implement this. Uh, on your own for POC for uh, again for for testing things out. If you want this particular thing that we did, of course, when we are going to be productizing, we will consider whether we want to include it as a part of our uh, REST API so that you can just grab it from our system. Uh, but this is uh, still up for decision. All right. Uh, Andy, on top of the product, uh, are there any performance concerns in making those OpenAI calls that you've experienced? Um, well, uh, first of all, about uh, performance, yes, OpenAI is not that fast, especially if you are using GPT-4 and not GPT-4 Turbo, which is uh, a little bit faster. Uh, but there are some ways to work around it. You can enable, um, how, the, how does it call, what's it called? Basically streaming when it's uh, sending you tokens as soon as it gets the token uh, ready. So you're not waiting for a complete text. Instead, you're receiving those like over web sockets uh, there. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty much answered the question. Andy, is 
any of your work on integrating LLM into the good data product available on GitHub so I can uh, get inspired. Uh, not at the moment. <laughs> Uh, not at the moment, but we already have this question uh, asked by our customers who are trying out Flex AI in uh, in lab environment, which I also recommend you to try out. Uh, and uh, we are considering whether we should uh, open source some part of it so that they, they can get inspired by it because they are building their own AI chats uh, on top of open AI and they are interested how can they uh, reuse our stuff that we already created, our functions in their own application. Uh, so yeah, we are considering about that. Maybe leave uh, anonymous. Please leave uh, your call, uh, your uh, calling card, and uh, I will reach out if this happens. Okay, about using AI for clustering data in a two D scatter plot. Aren't there better and robust algorithms for clustering that don't include LLMs? Um, I wasn't the one developing this, so maybe you can. Uh, you were showing this, but you were also not developing. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think that we are using LLM for clustering. There is a Python script behind the scenes that uh, that is uh, creating this uh, clustering and running them. We uh, also integrated it through Jupyter Notebook. So behind the things, it's like running a Python code, generates the clustering, and then we are just showing it on the on the UI, and we uh, add annotations generated by OpenAI on top of some of this uh, machine learning uh, things that we are do, doing outside of LLM. Uh, are there any OSS initiatives driven by good data? Well, there is uh, nothing like widely adopted that you might know, uh, probably, unless you're our customer, but we do open source some of our client libraries, like. Uh, UI SDK, basically the library that we are using to build our own UI, all the components there and all the visualizations. We open source it because um, our customers are using it to, to embed our analytics into their apps. We also have Python SDK, which is uh, open sourced. Um, and again, this is just a, a wrapper around our REST API written in Python. And it also has some support for Pandas and, uh, and uh, some more stuff around that. So. Um, if you are a customer of good data, yes. If you are not, then probably um, there is nothing that would interest you too much. Uh, we are also open sourcing most of our demos. So if we are building some demo to showcase a specific scenario, it's usually available on GitHub and you can use that. Uh, do you use a fine-tuned OpenAI model or the default? Uh, we are using default. We were considering to you to fine-tune model but there is a problem that when you fine tune uh, the model with some um, very specific context, let's say you have a list of database tables and inside of database tables, you have a list of available columns and that information is very specific. You cannot just figure out that ID looks something like this. You need to know exactly what ID is. And when you, um, when you fine tune this information into open AI model, it gets fuzzy. So, it might know that, yeah, there are, we are working with a database, there are some tables, but it can forget specific IDs. And uh, for that reason, we are not doing that. Instead, we are putting all our important information into the first system prompt that we send to OpenAI. All right, so if there are no more questions, then back to Hansa. Thank you, Andy. So I would like to welcome Václav Kocian with his presentation, UX of AI, not only for data analytics. Uh, Václav, the stage is yours. Thank you. OK, uh, let's get started. Let's. Okay, perfect. Now it works. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here, and uh, thanks, Andy, for a uh, nice presentation. And uh, I will actually continue with uh, some of that which uh, Andy started. And uh, now let's talk about it from a little less technical perspective. Let's talk about the user experience of artificial intelligence, of, uh, of using it and of uh, developing it for not only data analytics. So 
let's get started first of all uh, let me introduce myself uh, my name is Václav Kocian I work here as a senior UX designer at good data in a professional services team which means I work with uh, all our customers uh, designing custom data solutions for them and uh, I write about stuff which interests me uh, about UX on nextinux.com. And uh, when I'm not designing, I basically climb on every rock from local boulders to alpine peaks. So that's, that's more or less what I do. Uh, current AI development, the problem, which I believe it's with it, it's a bit of a wild west right now. It's uh, moving extremely fast, and uh, there are billions of dollars pouring into it from every direction, and uh, it has really unprecedented uh, interests from both consumers and enterprises. If you remember some uh, previous hype cycles, it has typical so like uh, more like closer, smaller group of people who are really into it, something like blockchain, but this is this. AI, it got really uh, massive, massive interest. And uh, if you if you are really following uh, all the all the AI news, it seems like a future from the sci-fi books we just read about a few years ago is already here. But uh, I would say it's only if you if you follow all that news. Otherwise, for for most people, it's it's not not so hot topic. Just ask your mom what ex excites her most from the latest AI innovations. So it's more like uh, William, William Gibson wrote that it's not evenly distributed, this future. It's, it's here, but not, not, so, not for everyone. Uh, and in this, uh, in this very fluid environment, it might, be, it might be challenging for product teams and companies to focus on, uh, on their users and their products rather than jumping on every new hype wave and uh, every new thing which appears uh, in the world of AI, every new language model. So, because speaking of users, they are in the middle of this, they, and they should be in the end using those products. And uh, not just the AI news following users, those innovators and early adopters on the, on the left of the Gauss curve, but uh, all of them. And, uh, most people, honestly, they, they want to do their job. They want basically reliable hammer that, that, you can, that they, can, they can use daily in their work and uh, not the latest prototype from the innovation lab. So just keep that in mind that it's still for the people. And uh, also generative AI currently, it's mostly represented and controlled by chat interface, but Beneath it, it's, it's so much more. The, the chat interface, it's, it's just the interface. It's just the thing on top. But unfortunately, what I sometimes see is that companies use very little creativity when, uh, when implementing AI. They are rushing to basically slap the AI chat on top, their existing product, and they can put the sticker AI powered on their website, and uh, they are cool, and they will raise a lot of money. But uh, it's, it's just the interface element. It's not what makes the product great for the users. So I, I believe that not everything should be a chat. Actually, I believe most products should not be a chat. It's not, not how, it, how it typically works. Because there are, there are many challenges with chat interfaces. They are great for, for example, chatting or exchanging messages. But first of all, uh, writing is hard. And uh, it's uh, well research through, I don't know, OECD and all those researches about the literacy. It's about uh, reading the text, but writing the text, putting ideas into words, it takes a lot of effort and knowledge. And it definitely takes more effort and knowledge than clicking just the button. So it's, it's uh, more difficult for, for the users. And also writing prompts including all those parameters, it's even harder than just uh, writing normal text. And as, uh, as Jacob Nielsen, uh, basically the founder of user experience, uh, he even called it like new interface paradigm. It's about intent-based outcome specification to first of all, in a prompt, specify what I want as an outcome, not clicking 
uh, on button after button to create that outcome. And lastly, when uh, all is left is chat window, the app suddenly has much less affordances, much less of those visual cues that uh, allow user to click around and to explore. And uh, user suddenly needs to uh, figure out through some manual, through some documentation, what he can put into that uh, chat window. So it's, so it's uh, less, less usable from this perspective. So how to approach it? How to, how to approach UX of AI? And uh, we have exciting challenge ahead of us because as I see it as uh, designers, developers, product managers, we can we finally and for the first time in history have the opportunity to actually build something on top of usable AI. Yes, there were some conversational assistants, but Siri or Alexa, they are not pretty smart. And now it's they suddenly those those chatbots suddenly understand us, which is which is very exciting. But we must not forget that uh, the user is still the hero of the product, not one interface element. So we need to focus on those users, on their workflows to make and make them faster, better, more precise, more enjoyable. And or we can invent completely new workflows enabled by the power of AI. But still, there is this those people who will be using the product and to make him make those users the hero of the product, not the one interface element. Because we need to try to resist the urge to force every interaction through the chat, in, chat interface, chat window. It's like looking at the world through the letterbox in the door. Yes, you can do it, but uh, I think you would agree that uh, you miss a lot of opportunities with it. So starting with users and their needs, and only then try to search how to fulfill those needs, how to enable them. It's the uh, other way around, not try to uh, bend all the use cases which you currently have so they would fit into the chat window. So from this point of view, let's review several examples of, uh, I would say, well-executed uh, AI implementations in existing products and uh, what we can uh, take as inspiration from it. I will start with Miro, uh, tool uh, many of you probably know and uh, many of you probably use every day. And uh, they, they took what AI can do best now, and that's generating texts or working with text in general. So you can, for example, in Miro, start creating a mind map and then uh, select one, one note in the mind map. And this nice contextual uh, toolbar appears and you can expand it with uh, more ideas. Or if you are doing some kind of user research, or user interviews, and you have a, a lot of notes on the stickies like this. You can ask Miro to summarize them because that's working with text. That's what AI is really good at right now. And I must say, I, I use it quite quite often, and it it works quite nicely. Or if you uh, if you, for example, thinking about information architecture, and uh, you would do card sorting uh, research. Recently, I read uh, a comparison between card sorting study of 200 people and card sorting done by uh, ChatGPT4 and it produced very similar results. So if you want some like preliminary validation of, for example, this information architecture, how would people structure uh, items into groups, it's perfectly doable with, with AI. And uh, the beauty of Miro is that it's in context. It's where you select things, there appears this, this button and yes, there is, of course, a chat window, but it's not, not the hero of the story. It's not the primary thing. And uh, similarly, it's uh, with Grammarly. It's uh, gray. It's, it's a tool that checks your, and of course, mind spelling and grammar for years using machine learning. And now with the AI assistant, it uh, helps you in like, uh, in write, with writing text, improving text quality, and again, it's uh, very contextual. This omnipresent green button or green icon, it follows you everywhere where you write texts. So, and allows you uh, through the chat window, but through the chat window with a lot, uh, lot of examples what you can do 
it you select the text and it will suggest what you can do with it so you don't need to think how to how to spell it out in the in the chat window what to what to want from it let's now move on to uh what andy was also talking a little and that's what we've done uh, in good data and first we also focused on contextual features so uh, on the level for example of the one visualization you can ask to uh, to produce a forecast for uh, for for a future trend of the data and it produces for selected amount of periods including the the error bars and it's just within this visualization or very similarly for example in the scatter plot uh, it can cluster the the dots into the selected number of uh, selected number of buckets and color codes them. So it allows you to see high see the high level how how those uh, groups uh, relates to each other. What are some patterns or relationships separating by separating them into clusters? Or lastly, one more contextual uh, contextual feature. We have in in this labs environment, which is like testing environment, is uh, this key driver analysis. So we have uh, the tree map on the left, which uh, has uh, some apartment rent prices by neighborhood, and uh, you can ask uh, uh, ask the AI to explain it why why it's like this. What what causes some metric to go up or down? In this case, for example, what causes the price to increase and it, when it crunches the rest of the data, which is available, it tells you that it's in this case like the number of rooms in those apartments. But it can tells you more information behind those data. So it helps user understand the relationship and influences of different factors behind those numbers. And of course, we have a chat. <laughs> uh, and uh, so it allows you to interact with the data and dashboards uh, as, as Andy uh, tell us, tell you already, uh, making it more accessible, for example, for less technical users to get, to get some quick business insights, explain complex visualizations or generate charts and metrics. And uh, uh, yeah, I uh, allow myself to summarize and this presentation into this few, few arrows that... Uh, the generative AI chatbot comes with great challenge of trust because how can how can you trust the numbers produced by AI? Exactly, it's it's just uh, creating next most likely token. So it's uh, sourcing the business data. It's it's completely different sport. It's not not uh, making them up. So uh, this chatbot it uses the prompt not to get the di data directly but rather to construct a metric or a tool to retrieve the exact number and only then present it to the user. So it explains the data to the user and not making the up. So, yeah, uh, I would summarize it that uh, we are living in a very exciting uh, age of unprecedented AI development. And uh, I would write to, like to emphasize not to forget about the users because they are in the end the ones who, who will be using the product. So make them the heroes of your product and uh, adding a chat interface on top alone uh, won't cut it, really. Try to think beyond the chat window. Thank you. So if you have any questions, you can ask them now or later there is one uh how do you decide uh well i need to think how how it was decided i wasn't at the at the center of this those decisions but uh i think we just went through basically where it made made sense and when where the uh where the ai would bring this uh Mm, more advantage, more uh, where it could enhance the, the tool. I'm not sure if I answer it correctly. Okay, uh, do you have any idea uh, on adding a new way of working with AI in your app? Uh, not only the chatbot, but something more contextual and interactive. I would say uh, it depends. And uh, mainly 
basically go to your application, think what it can do now, and uh, just try try something. Try something, figure it out, what can be improved, what, what specific tasks can be improved by AI, build a quick prototype and uh, and test it. That's, uh, that's what I can suggest. Uh, go out and uh, recruit five people on user interviews uh, or, or, you know, a company and, and test it. Test it with people. That's the only sure way how to, how to tell which will work and what not. Yeah, I might add to that uh, question that uh, I, I read some reports about uh, testing more like from user uh, UX perspective, testing uh, the websites like heuristic analytics, and that's not very well performed right now by by AI because it's, it cannot comprehend so such a big context for now. And uh, about the usability, it's a strict checklist, and this strict checklist can be tested with uh, with strict algorithm, let's say, to produce a score. It's not such a creative task for uh, for LLM. Uh, thank you for your questions. I can see that there are more in uh, Slido. We will answer these, but uh, let's have a break and we will answer these uh, in the end of all presentations. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's start. Our next presenter is Patrick. Uh, Patrick is going to talk about should you use Next.js for your next project. So, stage is here, Patrick. Thank you. So, hello everyone. I am uh, Patrick and I am very happy uh, that I can be here uh, with you today. My topic is about Next.js. It will be primary about, about Next.js with uh, a browser. But let me start with a question. Uh, can you please raise your hand if you use Next.js on a daily basis, let's say? Okay, so a few of you. Uh, those of you that, that you use Next.js daily, you will probably hate me because my talk is really just on Surface, but hopefully you will enjoy it. And for those that uh, don't use Next.js, I hope that you will learn, learn something interesting. So. Here is our agenda for today. I will talk a little bit about uh, React server components because uh, React is now, let's say, uh, server first. Uh, then I will mention good things about Next.js. Uh, I will mention not ideal things about Next.js. And of course, there will be some conclusion. Uh, please know that uh, these are just my thoughts. Uh, you can surely disagree with me and I will be happy with that. So. <laughs> Let's jump into it. Uh, I will start with uh, React server components. Uh, I think that we all understand that React is all about components. Uh, basically, you give a React component uh, props and it, it will render a piece of UI. Uh, in practice, each component is a function that uh, returns a React node. If you fold a lot of components together, you have a React tree. And uh, React tree is just a root uh, component with all of child components. Uh, so far, so simple, but uh, what's about uh, server components? Uh, it's funny, uh, we have now basically two Reacts. Uh, we can understand that we have a React server and React client. React server uh, takes the full React component tree, uh, executes component, until it reaches a client component, it's the first execution, and the result is something that is called React Server Component Payload, uh, which you can imagine as something like executed and not executed uh, components. Uh, it sends React Server Component Payload to React Client, and React Client is uh, something that uh, always was React, and it just know, know how to finish the wall tree. In a more practical way, imagine that you have an application, you visit a page, and it will start render a uh, server component until it reaches the client component, uh, the yellow one, and it defers the execution, uh, sends the React server component payload to React client, and it finishes the execution. 
recently I read a very good article that described uh, server component versus client components, uh, something like it's just about environment. If you use server components, you can use Node.js API. And if you use client components, you can use browser API. I, I really like this, let's say, uh, how to call it, mental model about two Reacts. And it uh, it simplifies uh, how we can how we can think about it. But that was quick interaction to React component. We can discuss it further afterwards. But now let's move to to Next.js. The first thing that I like about Next.js is server sorry uh, folder based routing. Uh, as you can see on the screen, you basically define your routes based on your folders. Uh, for example, dashboard setting and and it works. Uh, really well, it's easy. Other frameworks has, has adopted this uh, uh, paradigm, let's say, and uh, it's cool. It's uh, I like it a lot. Uh, you can use it in a simple way, as you can see on the, on the image, or you can do uh, more advanced features like uh, dynamic roads, for example, if you want to render uh, let's say detailed page based on user ID you can you can simply do it or uh, you can even do something that is called intercepting routes which can render a route uh, on another road and you can think okay uh, what's what's about it but imagine that you want to uh, render in a tooltip uh, detail page uh, like preview of detail page and you can easily do it with intercepting routes uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's very powerful. Uh, the next thing that I like about Next.js uh, is something that is ca uh, called layout, and I like it because you can define uh, layout of your application in one file, which uh, you have to have one layout file, which is called a root layout, and you can define for example the left panel, top panel body and, and these uh, basic components and it's shared across the screens so across the navigation it preserves state uh, it doesn't reload so uh, I I use it in our in our project and it's uh, it's cool uh, the next thing that I like about the nextjs can be simply described as developer experience uh, because uh, Next.js does a lot of things things for you out of the box. It optimizes images, uh, it cache data as much as possible, uh, it optimizes fonts, and uh, it's uh, it's quite a cool. Uh, also, one one thing that I like about Next.js is great documentation because you can find a lot of useful information here. Even if you don't plan to use uh, Next.js, you can learn a lot of good engineering practice, let's say. Uh, on the other hand, things that I don't like or I don't know how to <laughs> describe my feeling, but uh, uh, with Next.js and with React now, you can use something that is called server actions. And it's a function that is uh, run on server, but you can call it from client component or server component. and uh, you can use it in a good way, but you can use it as in a bad way. For example, as you can see uh, in the code snippet, uh, it's probably not something that you want to deploy in a production. And you know, it's in in Next.js, it's quite simple to do it. So uh, I don't know. I would like to discuss it discuss it with you after my presentation. What do, what do you think about uh, server actions? So yeah, uh, the thing that I'm struggling struggling most uh, are uh, the way how you fetch data in Next.js. Uh, if you use surrendering and you want to you want to refresh data on your uh, client, let's say every five minutes, or you want to use WebSocket, uh, you have a lot of duplicity. You need to first fetch data on server, and then you can you need to fetch data on on client. Especially if you use, for example, React query uh you you have to do it twice so uh i don't know uh i think that there there needs to be some improvements uh maybe both in in uh, in uh, next js and in react query but right now it's it's uh it's not very easy to use and the last thing uh about next js that i don't like is uh 
let's say if you want to use something that uh, that is not part of Vertcell, that is a company behind Next.js, uh, it is very hard. For example, we need to use WebSockets. And in the wall, documentation is just one sentence about WebSocket that you should not use it. Uh, I understand it that uh, from business perspective, that uh, Next.js uh, doesn't want to uh, promote this feature because uh, uh, from uh, because uh, they they want to deploy it on their hosting and and with WebSocket it's it's quite hard. So, but I don't like this approach. They should uh, give you at least some information how you can how you can use it. And the very last thing uh, is more about React. But React now uh, React documentation now says that uh, you should use uh, Next.js or Remix or other let's say meta frameworks. And uh, it's I don't know. Little bit weird. I think that React should not uh, recommend you to use, to use other frameworks. But anyway, to answer a uh, question, if you should use uh, Next.js on your next project, uh, I would recommend it to you. Uh, it will solve a lot of things out of the box. Uh, it will help you, but sometimes it will be like just what the fuck. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so hopefully you enjoy it and thank you for your time. Uh, are there any new questions to Patrick? You can ask directly using Slido. Why would you design a server component to be something that its data updates so frequently that I would face this problem? Yeah. Mm, you know, we preload data on a server. Uh, for example, if we have table, so we during uh, rendering or during, uh, during build time, we uh, we fetch data, then uh, we render the page, and for example, after I don't know 30 seconds, we want to reload the data. So we use WebSocket for that. But uh, but in this use case, you you firstly need to fetch data on server, and then again on client. So you know it's it's a little bit weird. So in which case you would recommend to use Next.js in our next application? Yeah. From my perspective, if you don't need to, like, for example, some heavy application that needs to reload every few seconds, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. But if you want to build, for example, some static website that needs to just load data, uh, I don't know, just during uh, build time or during uh, a render process, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very good to use from my perspective. I guess I guess that uh, when you need some server-side rendering instead of using React, just React. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. What about deploying uh, Next.js apps? Because I know you can deploy on Vercel, but Vercel can be very expensive. So. Yeah, that's true. Uh, also, good question. One thing that I didn't mention is that if you use React, uh, sorry, server actions, it can be very expensive because they are basically deployed on uh, AWS serverless functions, and it can be it can be expensive. And currently, in in Next.js, you can modify your build, and you can build like standalone application that you, you can deploy anywhere. But uh, the documentation, obviously, the documentation for this is not very good because it doesn't benefit Vercel because you will deploy it somewhere else. So yeah. Uh, today on Reddit, I read a discussion if you should use uh, React with white build. Uh, I don't know. Now we are about to build some application that will have uh, basically high, uh, very client intensive, intensive uh, you know, fetching data. And I am, I am thinking about using, using just pure React. Or recently I, I experimented with, with a framework called Quick which uh, should be really, really good, but uh, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, it's complicated and it needs a further discussion, let's say. Mm. You know, we started to build it like a month ago, so it's like 50-50 right now, but uh, in the future, I think it will be, I don't know, uh, right now it's like 50-50. So yeah, that's the case. <laughs> Uh, are uh, React server components limited by rendering strategies such as server-side rendering, static rendering, uh, etc.? 
uh as far as as far as i don't uh, i know uh i don't think so because uh react team works closely with uh next j s team so i i don't think that there is any limitation at all but uh surely i don't know good question <laughs> If you have uh, another question, I will be there the whole evening so we can we can talk about Next.js in more details. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now, last but not least, I would like to welcome Lukáš and Petr. Uh, they have presentation about building data application for all. And I would like to emphasize uh, Lukáš and Petr because they, they are special. They uh, were not on our banner for this promo. So uh, you see them actually for the first time. So guys, stage is yours. Thanks, thanks for the intro. That is what you Okay. So now you should see our slides. Great. And then we can start. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, Honza already introduced us, but uh, my name is Lukáš, and here's my colleague Petr. We are both working as UX designers here at Good Data. And uh, in our final talk, it's fourth one and the last one before it's over or not over, it's time for the beer. Uh, we will talk to the, about uh, building not only data applications for all. And in the first part of today's meetup, uh, there were two presentations about AI and I want to you know, uh, talk about it a bit more. And you know, when there are these new ways how to interact with technology, and there are these new types of interfaces, not only the chat interfaces, but other ways how we consume data and how we consume information. It's still important to think that uh, even though all the information, all the knowledge can be just a prompt away, it works only if you can use mouse, you can use keyboard, you can see the screen, right? And you can hear the audio. So that's why. Uh, we want to talk about uh, why we think that accessibility still matters and uh, how it can look in practice. Uh, and I will start with a little confession. Uh, back in my internship days, that's uh, already a couple of years ago, I often designed solutions uh, based on my knowledge and skills. Um, most of the time thinking that I know the best what is good for the users, right, for myself. But there is the problem, there is the catch. Uh, if I use my own abilities and my own uh, skills as a baseline, uh, I create something that might work for me, that might be useful for me, but it's challenging for uh, the other people, right? And in, eventually it can exclude some people. And talking about exclusion, I did a little research uh, during the break and there were not that many people who has experienced some arm injury, like broke their arm. But I hope there are at least some that can relate to how it can be really cumbersome to go through your daily life if you break your arm. That's not something that you usually plan to do, right? And then it changes everything, right? You struggle with your daily chores and some things that are, you know, that you take as granted eventually are really hard for you. And uh, that's my point, that the exclusion can be sometimes temporary, that even small injuries, something that we are not planning, can really change dramatically how you can interact with the world around you. Think also about just looking into a bright light, something that you know, usually normal people don't do, but it sometimes happens, and then you just don't see for a couple of seconds, a couple of moments, but it completely, you just lose the ability to see. And sometimes exclusion can be also situational. Uh, throughout the day, we go through different environments, uh, think about uh, busy uh, public transportation. And you meet your friend and you want to talk to them about something cool. 
but you can't because it's just too loud. You can't hear each other. So you have to wait until you get out of the tram and then you can continue with the discussion. So the point is that everyone sometimes are excluded. And even though designing for people with permanent exclusion or disabilities might seem like, you know, uh, something that is maybe blocking you or that's taking too much time, it's important to think that including these people is also including many more other people who might be not permanently disabled, but also temporary or situational. And I want to uh, mention one more uh, example, that's closed captioning. Uh, that's technology that was, it's like subtitles, but with also the context, like what's happening with the sounds and the atmosphere, right? So that was something developed for the community of hard of hearing. And, but I think nowadays everybody's using it some kind of sense. Everybody can imagine that you're going through subway, through Metro and you are watching your video, but suddenly your earphones battery dies and you know, closed captioning can save your day. But it's not only about people, also uh, business can benefit from inclusive design um, because you are now making the experience better for more people. The customer satisfaction is higher and you can eventually you know, expand your audience reach. So there are like more people actually happy and your business can grow. And more on the administrative side, there are more and more legal you know, restrictions and obligatories that you need to comply with some sort of standards. So including in inclusive design from the beginning can also decrease uh, the legal risks. And now uh, when you kind of like understand why uh, inclusive design and accessibility matters, you might uh, ask yourself, how do you know when something is accessible? How do I actually tell if I'm not the one to judge, right? Or at least not for the full spectrum of exclusions. And that's testing. And there are many ways how you can test for accessibility of digital products. Uh, usually you follow some accessibility standards and you want to you know, comply with them. And there are many of them, but I want to mention one. So if they, you, don't, you are working on projects that don't have a specific requirements, uh, there is Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, uh, for short, WCAG. And uh, there's really a nicely categorized set of criteria that you need to follow in order to be compliant and in order to make the product accessible. But don't worry, uh, you don't need to do it all manually. There are some tools like uh, the DevTools in Chrome where you can run an accessibility audit, but the automation tests available are all not, never enough. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there are many more situations that you can't just automate, you need to do manually, and preferably you need to test with people that have this exclusion. And now, uh, that was the first part of our presentation, and I will pass the word to Petr, who will show you what building accessible products can look like and how it also might like if a product is not optimized for accessibility and somebody uh, with some restriction tries to access it. Yeah, thanks, Lukashi. Can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, so that was the, let's say, theory part. Uh, in the practical part, we prepared for you a dashboard because we are a data company. Uh, actually, not just one dashboard, but two dashboards. They seem visually identical, but in fact, they are not. For somebody who can see, the difference is massive. And I would like to show you their experience. So let's try to simulate it. Uh, I'm going to use uh, screen, screen reader, which is built in into Mac OS. This is uh, something which you can try on your own. You cannot, uh, you don't have to buy anything. It's free, and you definitely should try your product. How how it works with the screen reader. So let's take it right again. Voiceover on Safari. Accessible sales dashboard window. Accessible yeah. sales dashboard. Web content has keyboard focus. Sorry for that loud sound. 
I will shut it down very quickly, but I would like to to show you at least some of the experience somebody who cannot see uh, has. So uh, you might assume that somebody using screen reader actually used it for reading a screen, just one line by line, but this is not in fact uh, true. Uh, the usage is based on shortcuts, based on uh, high level summaries of the page and uh, the goal is to get to the right information quickly without the reading most of the most of the page so to help that uh, uh, screen readers have a lot of useful features so we can show a couple of them department dashboard okay so indicators dashboard it could be kind of finicky, you know, as you can see. Uh, so I will try voice it. over off. I will try it. Try it. Voice over on Safari. Accessible sales dashboard. Windows spots menu. Yeah, this is this is uh, the stuff I wanted to show you. Basically, all of the screen readers uh, provide some kind of summaries. You can see now this window spot menu is actually used to control this part of the screen. I can jump Tool between this, between tool, toolbar. I can tab navigate tab two tabs group between tabs, etc. And uh, this is not everything. I can links obviously menu, item. open data table for sales growth by market segment. I can obviously see all the links and etc. I will shut it down now because I I understand that it might be confusing. And from now on you can actually read the information on the on the screen. So uh, to illustrate the point uh, what the user typically do with he which when he cannot see uh, he looks for uh, kind of semantic information. He looks for uh, something which will help him understand what this page is about. And this is a good example. You can see that this dashboard has some kind of structure visually and uh, the uh, the screen reader trying to simulate this for the, for the user. So I can see here that uh, the headings tell me that this is a dashboard. It has some filters and it has some KPIs information, and I can also see that it has some trends. And I can quickly, very quickly get to, let's say, most important information for me, it's total accounts. So I can get to it and very quickly learn that the total accounts is 2,104. Uh, so this is one example of the features which are provided by the screen reader and uh, which are possible only if the page is optimized. Uh, I can show you some some other. Let's say you are interested into into the into the chart. This might be a good example because you might assume that somebody who cannot see uh, uh, the chart is unusable for him. But uh, this is not true. If you provide correct correct alt information, he can learn what the chart is about. So here is an example that he can learn that this chart is showing. Uh, some breakdown uh, into the health, health finance, uh, and tech segments, etc. And to put it, you know, or go a little bit farther, you can also uh, provide something like data table uh, link, which could be browsed uh, outside of this experience. So this is for many situations better than trying to. Uh, describe the chart because the user can go line by line and navigate in the table as he chooses. So this is uh, uh, the experience in the optimized way, the optimized dashboard. Let's see how it works in the, let's say, less accessible dashboard. Uh, you can see that I have only the form control. Nothing else is provided. And now I would like to show you, show, you, show to you what is the difference in the code. So let me try to do that. Ooh. Okay, okay. I know I know that you, most of you are developers, so this is not really code for you, but uh, for us UX designers, HTML HTML is is a code. So just to illustrate illustrate the example, uh, here you can see that I semantically uh, correctly defined the header. Uh, in the in the optimized uh, dashboard, and you can see the same example here on the right that it's using just a diff. So for the screen reader, it's very hard to actually know what this uh, part of the 
code is about and uh, uh, I'm making it easier for, for, for the reader if I use correct HTML. And the same goes for headings, for uh, basically any, any markup which has some meaning. And there is obviously a lot of situation where uh, you have to use uh, markup which inherently doesn't have any meaning and you are building something from scratch from divs. But in this situation, you can actually use uh, something called ARIA role. Uh, this is something like extra to the to the markup, which you can use to describe the, those elements which don't have typically uh, the meaning. So you can see here, for example, this section doesn't have any meaning, but if I put ARIA label filters, the screen reader actually read filters if I visit this part of the page. And uh, another, if, let's say, interesting way how to provide more meaningful information to user without uh, ability to to see the page is to provide him some additional information. You can see here in this part, we are making a summary of this difference on the dashboard. I can show you the uh, what this is about. This is basically this element. And... Uh, this is it might be enough for somebody who can see but for somebody who cannot it's uh, very beneficial if you uh, if you describe it a little bit more clearly that this is 20 percent increase compared to the previous period and this could be again done with the area roles i can skip the uh, previous element by hiding it by this this area role and to uh, left leave the screen digital read only the second part and the same uh, example might be uh, uh, provided to the to the chart itself. You can see that it's very easy. Just provide the alt information, and the uh, and the reader actually describe what the chart is about. Yeah, so that's it from the practical part. I can finish the presentation with uh, saying that accessible application work better for everyone. So please try to think about everyone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, there are two questions uh, in Slido. The first one is how many UX designers are there in your staff? There are five. Thank you, Petre. Do you include yourself? Another question is, any suggestions on working with accessibility trees? You can definitely use uh, built-in support in Chrome. They uh, recently improved it a lot. Uh, I can not say much more than that. Uh, we are still experimenting with this part. Uh, so just read about it a little bit more. But I think it's a nice way how to visualize mm -hmm. how this, you know, uh, screen will be then read or understood by a screen reader, for instance. So again, it's all built in, for instance, in Chrome, and you can, in the accessibility tab, uh, render the accessibility tree, and so you can see you know, the semantic uh, interpretation of the page. Yeah, so again, uh, we have um, not only the questions, but uh, there is this link, uh, there's a great accessibility developer guide, where there are many more examples, and not only the basic stuff that we show to you today, but also for people maybe that already have some knowledge around accessibility, the the most you know modern ways how to approach it, and also maybe uh, tips and tricks how to do it. Uh, I would really recommend it. It's it's a great resource. Yeah. That's a great question. The question was like how much uh, time and effort it is actually to make uh, something accessible. I don't think I have a number for the accessibility, like how much is an effort, but I believe that if you think about it from the beginning, right, if you include it in your developer workflow, and I was mentioning this automation tools, it's not only about audits, it's also about some things that can you can include as you code, like some lint tools, something that you can actually include in your pipelines that will be checking, hey, is this actually passing the tests? I believe that the effort is pretty minimal.
Yeah, okay, I will read the question. Can you use AI for testing accessibility? GPT-4 can access the web now. Yeah, that's true. We haven't tested GPT-4 to help us with accessibility, but again, this is this could be considered automatic testing at best. Uh, if you count in the hallucination which GPT is, uh, is uh, known for, I wouldn't rely on it for sure. Uh, and it's leave again the need for manual testing because you cannot actually do it properly with just uh, these language models. Thanks. Uh, I think the second one, the first one, yeah. Have you considered employing your AI colleagues and creating a solution for automatically alerting components to add accessibility features? Okay, that's an interesting use case about how connecting the AI and accessibility. But I, again, believe that there are already some automated tests there and maybe you don't really need AI for that. Uh, as Vashek was mentioning, usually the standards are like set of criteria that are really specifically defined. I would again mention the WCAG, um, it's really, there are code examples, things of do and don't, so you can do it. And also in this uh, accessibility developer guide, there are already links on existing tools that are, for instance, also open source that you can use in your projects. But uh, yeah, maybe we can talk about it over beer. We have another uh, hypothetical question. Don't you think that AI powered screen readers I haven't seen one yet uh, that can understand what is on the screen could render these area attributes obsolete. Um, yeah, uh, nice hypothetical question. I believe that still uh, maybe AI can you know comprehend the whole context and sometimes getting this shortcut into the thing that you want because you are kind of like describing also the content for the AI, right? So you're helping also the AI to read the stuff. So I believe that still giving some meaning to the code uh, helps not even people, but also AI. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is the end of presentations, but this is not the end of meetup. Uh, there will be plenty of food, drinks, uh, time for networking. Uh, thank you for attending, and I would also say that we have uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, also Good Data Community Slack, so if you have any questions or are you interested in something, please reach to us. We will be more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you.